Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. So while in my last video we spoke about viruses, in this video we're going to talk about bacteria. And in particular we'll focus on one type of bacteria called E. coli and how a recent study has shown that E. coli can be forced to grow on only carbon dioxide. And this is work taken from a cell paper that was published in November last year, so I'm a little bit late to the party. But anyway, in this video we'll focus why they did this study, how they did it, and what are the next steps. So to understand why they did it, we need to firstly discuss why they chose E. coli. So E. coli, as a bacterium, is very easy to engineer, and as you can see here, it grows very rapidly. But to be able to grow, bacteria need energy. Where do they get this energy from? Well, bacteria get their energy from respiration. So we, as humans, respire just like E. coli, and the process of respiration takes glucose and oxygen and converts it into water and carbon dioxide. And the process of respiration generates ATP, which is the energy source that our cells need. So as I said, we also respire like E. coli. And also like E. coli, we are both referred to as heterotrophs. So what is a heterotroph? So simply put, a heterotroph is a fancy term used to describe organisms that use get their carbon for biomass production from organic, organic compounds produced by other organisms. So this is the reason why we eat food, because we can't actually make it ourselves. I'm not going to complain about that, do you like to eat? But whilst we respire, like E. coli, plants also respire as well. However, they aren't heterotrophs, they're instead referred to as autotrophs. So what makes plants different is that they undergo photosynthesis and they can use this process to generate their own food. So they take carbon dioxide and they take water and they convert this into glucose and they release oxygen. But whilst respiration provides energy, the key route to photosynthesis is it requires energy to do the reaction. And so these autotrophs, these plants, they can do photosynthesis because they have carbon dioxide fixing enzymes and they have a harvesting complex that can collect this energy that it re requires to carry out this process. So what this paper set out to do was to see whether or not they could convert E. coli, which is a heterotroph, into an autotroph, which means getting it to use carbon dioxide as its food production source. But why actually bother with this in the first place? Well, we love plants, well at least I do, and what plants do is they assimilate the atmospheric carbon dioxide into the production of food, fuels and also biochemicals. And so since we're facing crop demand, there's huge deforestation, wouldn't it be great if we could use and culture E. coli to achieve this instead? So this brings me on to the next question, which is how can this actually be achieved? Well, there are three main challenges that need to be addressed to be able to turn E. coli into autotrophs. Firstly, they need to have this carbon dioxide fixing machinery. And by machinery, I'm talking about the proteins and enzymes needed to catalyze the biochemical reactions. And then secondly, they need to get this energy source, this reducing power to carry out the process. And then lastly, you need a way to regulate and coordinate the carbon dioxide fixing machinery with the energy reduction synthesis as well. So the solution discussed in this paper has a two-pronged approach. Firstly, they use genetic engineering and they couple this with the use of adaptive laboratory evolution. So firstly, let's talk about genetic engineering, which is simply just manipulating the genes present in the bacterium. So what they did was to solve the first problem about having the carbon dioxide fixing machinery is, well, you guessed it, they added the genes that enable this to happen. And so two of the genes they added was Rubisco and Phosphoribulose kinase. But the problem is they still need this reducing power as well. And so the reducing power in terms of process powering the photosynthesis reaction is it comes from the reduced form of NAD+, which is NADH. And so they needed to generate NADH. And plants get this from energy, from light energy, but obviously they needed an alternative strategy for E. coli. So they did this by using formate to generate NADH electrochemically. And the reason that this works is that formate is more electrochemically negative 
then NAD plus and so electron transfer goes to NAD plus and you generate NADH. So to do this they needed to also add formate dehydrogenase to the bacterium so that they could actually process formate. Okay well I went through that quite fast, you might have to watch it on like 0.5 speed or something. But anyway, the sad part to the story is that they did this and this alone wasn't enough for the bacterium to depend solely on carbon dioxide for its biomass accumulation. So they needed to couple this with adaptive lab evolution, which is definitely a rational approach because you can use the power of evolution to come up with the solution to this problem. And so adaptive laboratory evolution is kind of pretty much does what it says. You have your a bacterium and you grow them in the kind of desired conditions that you're looking for and this enables the acaeoli with the desired traits to grow faster or enables them the more likely to survive and you just repeat this process and you're going to enhance the proportion of bacterium that have the traits that you're looking for and then you can see at the end of it and they did this for one year what has changed in the acaeoli and this can by finding the mutations you can try to understand how the E. coli evolved, in this case, to be able to eat carbon dioxide. So just to further reiterate, going through this evolution process, the bacteria are going to grow and as they grow they accumulate mutations. And so there were three categories of mutations that they found in the E. coli population that successfully grew solely on carbon dioxide. And the first category were found in genes directly linked to carbon dioxide fixation, which kind of makes sense in this case, right? And then the second category of mutations that they found were in genes that are kind of, they're commonly found, or they crop up in experiments that use this adaptive laboratory evolution. And so these include genes such as genes that regulate gene expression and protein synthesis. And so it kind of makes sense that maybe by altering the um, global rates of the bacterium, it could enable some to grow faster than others. So it could still be interesting to find out what genes in particular are mutated. And then lastly, they found mutations in other genes that I guess were somewhat unexpected. And so these either require further testing or they could just be bystanders. So I've told you why, I've told you how, what is the next steps with this study? Well. As they describe, it's pretty much a proof of concept paper, they've shown that it's possible to take an E. coli, which is a heterotroph, and convert it into an autotroph. However, one of the motivations for the study was to find a way to use carbon dioxide instead of producing it. But the current strategy uses formate, and by using formate they actually have a net gain of carbon dioxide. So in the future they hope to couple the formate use to a renewable energy source. So they're not quite there yet, but they are definitely in the right direction. And I really like this quote from the paper, which is the establishment of synthetic autotrophy demonstrates the incredible plasticity of central metabolism and could provide a framework for future carbon neutral bioproduction. Pretty awesome, eh? Who knew metabolism could be so fun? So check out the paper. It's a really good read. And as always, thanks for listening.